So the other other week, I revisited my tapping arm. In that video, I was attracted to the idea of using a mechanical magnetic switch for securing workpieces. I was on the right track with the idea, and I still think magnetism is the ideal solution for this tapping arm. But my last attempt was lacklustre. A quick recap for the uninitiated. The tapping arm is a tool to make tapping easier and more accurate. It features a counterweight to support the chuck and keep it neutrally weighted, keeping taps from crashing into the workpiece and making installing them into the chuck much easier. When working with small taps, this means I can focus on the rotational force I'm applying and not worry about keeping the tap straight. There were positives and negatives to the previous iteration. A good feature was that it looked cool when you used it. And, um, that's literally it. On the flip side, this moving bed design wobbled a lot, uncentered the workpiece easily, had a very small work area, and slowly, but constantly, unscrewed itself. Back to the drawing board, there was one big design decision on my mind. How am I actually going to activate the magnetic field? These magnetic switches work by inverting the position of the poles between two rings of magnets. Each ring is made of a set of ferrous cores, in my case M12 nuts, with magnets between them. Rotating the ring 60 degrees changes the flow of magnetism either in or out of the chuck. The easiest option would be a simple arm attached to the lower ring. This works okay, but it becomes less ideal of a solution the bigger the bed gets, with the arm having to get longer and longer to the point that it just looks a little silly. The other option I ended up going with was a cam that could convert a linear motion to a rotary one. This let me make an actual switch for my magnetic switch that looks and functions much nicer. The rest of the design process was pretty much just reskinning my existing design. So with that done, the build could begin once again with some printed parts. This begins with flipping the bed over and installing the first six M12 nuts into place, each of which has a printed filler to keep any metal from getting inside. These are then held in place with a generous amount of super glue. Flipping this over, I apply more glue to the other side before screwing it down to a board. This is to help level the epoxy we are about to pour. I've never poured epoxy before and its inclusion here is something I kind of regret, kind of don't. The idea first came to my mind because I wanted a more resilient work surface. And to be honest, I didn't think about it much more than that. I was hesitant about the idea and almost didn't go ahead with it several times, but I ultimately decided to give it a try. The pour overall went very smoothly, aside from these slight spillovers which will annoy me forever. I think I got very lucky with the lack of bubbles, or maybe that's just normal for such a thin pour? I'm not actually sure. I will be trying epoxy more in the future, in particular epoxy granite experiments, but no promises when I'll get around to that. After that dries, we can get on with installing the magnets. This is admittedly more than a little fiddly. Carefully checking the polarity, I go around slowly and after more than a few retries, finally get all the magnets in place. Usually I put a core in last, which I find a bit easier, but here, we need to do that with a magnet. Yes. As a final touch, I install this brass tube. The purpose of this is to funnel chips past the inner workings and out of the base, unlike the previous design that just dumped Schwarf straight into the moving parts. We also install this thin piece of plastic to keep the magnets from touching later. Now with the bed done, we can move on with the main body.
The lower ring of the switch is almost identical to the original, aside from now looking like a goldfish. It gets a similar treatment to the upper ring, installing a set of magnets and nuts carefully into their places, before it can be set in place in the base. Oh shit, I'm losing control of the magnets. <laughs> Over the goldfish's tail, we can mount the switch, and then give the mechanism another quick test run. Maybe a couple of quick test runs. Once I'm happy that it's all in place, we can finally combine the top and bottom halves, securing them with four bolts in the corners. And with that, the new vise is done. This is every bit as satisfying as I hope it looks. I printed this vise last time. It has a piece of steel for a base so it can work with these mag chucks. Despite its questionable epoxy surface, this version fixes everything wrong with its predecessor. More accurate, no more wobble, and it's now not impossible to use with larger workpieces. For one last touch. And so that concludes the fourth tapping arm video I've made. That's three more videos than most projects get here, and for good reason. I would easily say that the tapping arm is my favourite tool I've designed. It certainly gets used the most. There still might be a part five, eventually. I had a few ideas that I haven't quite implemented just yet. These include an extended base with mess and tap storage, a taller workspace, and a built-in cutting fluid dispenser, but another time. I would also like to thank everyone for subscribing. We are almost at 100k, and for that milestone I'll be releasing two extra videos, one on my design process and one on my filmmaking process, since these have both been quite heavily requested. Files are in the description. Thank you to my patrons, and to you, as always, for watching.